The Steakhouse by Ron Ripley. The stuff's still in there, Becky said, her hands cupped around the side of her face as she peered into one of the back windows. Howie flicked the butt of his cigarette into the sewer grate, grinned at the spray of embers from the burning tobacco, and said, What stuff, and why the hell do you want to go in there? Becky turned around, brushed a stray forelock of pink hair back and winked at him. Did you see the taxidermy in there? The what? he asked. Becky sighed and shook her head. I forget how stupid you are. The deer heads and stuff on the walls. I'm not stupid, Howie grumbled, walking up to the back window. He used his hands to block out the cold, fluorescent light of the parking lot's lamps and squinted. In the gloom of the abandoned restaurant's dining area, he saw the deer heads. Four of them, maybe more. It was hard to tell with all of the shadows. A glance at the ceiling showed three large chandeliers hanging down, each one made from twenty or thirty sets of antlers. Along the walls were pictures of cowboys, even some hats hung above the booths. Big old, wide-brimmed hats just like John Wayne used to wear in the westerns. Damn, how he said, nodding appreciatively. Right? Becky grinned at him, played with the gauge in her left ear and asked, So, want to go in and see what we can get? Howie glanced around, saw a couple of teens walking into the Denny's restaurant across the lot and asked, Think we can do it? She rolled her eyes and said, Howie, it's 2.30 in the morning. There's not going to be a better time. He thought about it for a moment, scratched the back of his head and asked, Think it's got an alarm? No. Becky said, and he heard the exasperation in her voice. He didn't care though. He was the one on parole for assault, not Becky. Listen, she said, a playful, pouting tone replacing the frustration, the place has been empty for three years, which means it won't even have electricity. You sure? Howie asked, shooting a furtive look at the building. I'm sure, she purred. My dad's a contractor remember? When a place gets shut down like this, banks send in guys like my dad to winterize it. That means the water gets shut down, all the pipes drained. Nobody's paying the gas bill or the electric bill, or anything, so everything's shut off. Worst thing we'll find in there are probably some traps. Howie still wasn't convinced. Something was off about the place, and he didn't like it. All of those concerns vanished though as Becky pressed close to him, her breath hot against his ear as she whispered, and will be alone. Howie smiled and nodded. Taking her by the hand, he led Becky to the rear entrance. Tall shrubs had grown over the small walkway, and the shadows around the door offered a place to hide from any prying eyes if someone should drive by. Howie dug his phone out of his pocket hit the flashlight and held the phone up so he could see what the door looked like. Holy crap, he muttered, looks like we're not the first ones. A pry bar lay on the concrete walkway. Dirty, orange rust stains spread out from the tool. It had been weeks since the last heavy rain, and the bar looked as though it had lain there for a lot longer than that. The door itself wasn't closed all the way, almost a quarter of an inch of it was past the framework. Howie only hesitated for a moment before he took hold of the handle and eased the door back. The hinges screamed in protest, metal grinding against metal. He winced, heart racing as he pulled the door back far enough for the two of them to slip into the abandoned restaurant. As he stood just inside the doorway, his nose wrinkled and he fought back the urge to gag. A rank, fetid odor filled the air. It was as if someone had left a dumpster full of rotting food baking in the August sun, and then dumped the contents in the restaurant. God, he complained, this place stinks. Grow up, Becky said, slapping him on the arm as she passed by. A long, low groan sounded from the far left, silencing any comeback Howie could have offered. What the hell was that, he demanded, twisting toward the sound. What was what? Becky shot back over her shoulder, maneuvering through the dining room. At the few tables in the room center, 
the chairs had been appended and stacked on top, as if waiting for the morning crew to come in and clean the floors. The thick layer of dust showed that the restaurant was waiting in vain. Howie shined the light on the floor, looking at the animal tracks that cut through the dust, trying to see where exactly the noise had come from. Put the light out. Becky snapped. Do you want someone to notice us? Howie rolled his eyes, but he turned off the light, stuffing his phone into his back pocket. So, Becky said, flashing him a smile, which one do you think I should take home? I don't know, he grumbled. Just pick one. I don't like it in here. What? Becky asked, snickering. Are you afraid of the dark, Howie? No, he said, I just don't like it in here. A groan came out of the darkness at the far end of the room. Holy crap, Becky hissed, is someone here? I don't know, Howie whispered, suddenly sweating. Let's just get the hell out of here. She shook her head. No. We should make them get out. I want those damned heads. Are you out of your mind? Howie demanded. Becky glared at him. I want a head. I am not leaving without one. With that, she turned her back on him and walked across the floor. Hey, she said, her voice low and threatening, whoever's in here, you need to get the hell out, understand? This is my place now. No one answered her. She glanced over her shoulder at Howie, but he only shrugged. You better come with me, she whispered fiercely. Howie's shoulders sagged as he followed her towards the darkness. Answer me. Becky said, raising her voice a few octaves higher. A long, low moan was the only response given, and Howie saw her become tense. He knew that her temper was rising, that her anger would get the better of her, and that the situation was going to get worse in a matter of moments. God damn it, Becky snarled, her Doc Martin boots thudding on the restaurant's worn floor. Howie glanced around, a sense of unease growing. Becky. Shut it, she hissed at him. To the stranger in the darkness, she said, come out. No one came out of the shadows. As they approached the far end of the restaurant, the stench they had first encountered grew stronger. God, Becky, how he coughed, gagging, this place stinks. I think somebody might have died in here. Yeah, maybe the person who's hiding killed them, she said, her voice thick with sarcasm. It's just rotting food or something. Get over it. Before Howie could protest, she raised her voice again to the unseen squatter. Listen, she commanded, if you're not out of here in thirty seconds, we're going to drag you out and beat you up. Something wet and heavy was dragged across the floor, the sound both irritating and frightening. That's it, Becky fumed. They've had enough time. Give me your light. Howie didn't bother arguing. He pulled his phone back out, switched the flashlight on and handed the phone to her. Becky swung the phone up, shining it down at an angle. The light it cast was bright and harsh, yet it couldn't penetrate to the far wall, which was less than twenty feet away. She muttered something about Howie buying cheap electronics and walked forward. Howie followed close behind her, not wanting to be too far away. He glanced at the walls and the windows, wondering how much force it would take to break the glass if they had to get out in a hurry. What the hell? Becky asked, coming to a sharp stop. Howie almost bumped into her but managed to twist away in time. As he regained his balance, he looked at the back wall, tried to understand what Becky was concerned about, and then he saw it. A large, black stain spread across the lower third of the wood-paneled wall. In the cone of the phone's light, the darkness had no form, no definition. It wasn't a wall hidden in shadow. The wood hadn't been painted black. There was nothing to be seen. Nothing to touch. But even as he looked at it, how he understood that the lower portion of the wall pulsed. It moved in an erratic rhythm that caused him to shake. I think we should go, 
Howie whispered, and his words were punctuated by a long, low growl that coincided with the curious, wet dragging sound they had heard a minute before. Yeah, Becky whispered, all of the bravado gone from her voice. She took a step back, and Howie screamed. A long tendril of shadow shot out of the darkness with a horrifying, numbing speed. Unable to close his eyes against the sight, Howie watched as the dark limb lashed out, snapping and coiling around his thigh. His eyes widened, and a heartbeat later he screamed again, a sound of surprise mingled with pain and terror. Howie felt himself jerked back with all of the morbid grace of a fish on a hook. His phone fell from Becky's hand, clattering against the floor, the light shining up at the ceiling. More tendrils spat out of the shadow on the wall as Howie screamed her name. But Becky did nothing. She stood and watched, a look of curiosity and mild fascination on her face. For a fleeting moment, rage replaced Howie's fear, and he screamed at her. Becky's response was a smirk, and before he could let loose his fury, he felt a terrible, sharp pain. Slowly, from the ceiling, long shadows unfurled. Hundreds of dark tendrils snapped out, racing towards him. Howie tried to run, to rip away the thick limb wrapped around his own, but Becky pushed him back. He slammed into a table, knocked the appended chairs down and hit the floor hard enough to crack his teeth together. Pain exploded in his jaw, and he knew something had broken, but fear drove him back to his feet, pushed him forward. It wasn't enough. The first of the tendrils pierced his clothes, hidden barbs digging into his skin and dragging him to a stop. Help me, he screamed. Becky shook her head, a small, pleased smile on her face. Becky! Howie begged. No, she said unsympathetically. It's hungry, and it needs to eat. Howie shrieked and clawed at her as she deftly stepped out of reach. He tripped, and as he hit the wood, he felt thousands of needles puncture his flesh. They tore into his arms and legs, buried themselves into his back and chest. Dug into his stomach and neck. Howie opened his mouth to beg, and more tendrils raced into his throat, pulling at the soft flesh of his cheeks and shredding his tongue. All that slipped free from him was a long, plaintive moan, one that filled the restaurant as he was pulled backward. A hideous trio of tongues, barbed and glistening in the light, slapped out onto the floor, creating a low, wet, dragging sound as they reached for Howie. The air became moist and foul, and the last rational thought he had was the understanding that the shadow on the wall was a mouth, and he was being dragged into it. Next Story Thunder Run by David Longhorn Isn't it amazing, asked Lampkin. That he trod these very boards. Strode glanced at the fat little man in bemusement, tinged with annoyance. He looked down at the uneven boards beneath their feet. The stage of the theater was much like any other, as far as he could see. Sorry, said Strode, who we talking about again? Lampkin looked hurt as well as nervous, eyes wide in a face glistening with sweat. Why, Stan Laurel, of course. Stuart is very keen on Laurel and Hardy, put in Dr. Mountford, the other trustee. Oh, right, said Strode, turning away from the pair and taking another look around the stage. Theater history, fascinating I'm sure. Outside the Adelphi Theater, posters advertise tribute bands to acts that had been big in the 80s, plus a few upcoming concerts by actual bands that had been big in the 70s. Comedians were also featured prominently, but there were no real big names. Mostly acts that had been big in the 90s. Rather optimistically, given that it was only June, the Adelphi was also inviting people to buy tickets to the Christmas pantomime. Snow White, it was, starring some reality show winner and some pouting nonentity from a third-rate girl band. And now Lampkin was trying to persuade him that the Adelphi was a going concern that just needed a little cash injection. Trying to make Strode fall in love with the place. Pathetic, thought Strode, as he assessed just how long it would take to demolish the place. A business dying on its feet, 
and all this idiot can talk about is history. I don't think Mr. Strode is keen on showbiz nostalgia, said Dr. Mountford. He is a man of business, after all. Yeah, right, said Strode, looking at the woman dubiously. When he had heard that one of the trustees of the theater was a woman, he had anticipated a bit of banter, maybe a pat on the backside in some post-meeting fun in his hotel room. But when he met Isadora, all thoughts of fun fled. She was one of those arty women with no posterior to pat, just a lot of skin and bone seemingly held together with ethnic jewelry. The other trustee, Lamkin, was a typical enthusiast, the sort who volunteered for charity. Strode despised them both, but was careful not to show it. So it's a very old building, he said. And costly to maintain. That's why I think you should accept my offer, as you won't get a better one. And of course it's a time-limited offer. If you turn me down and then change your mind, the price I'm prepared to pay goes down. Oh, we're very interested, burbled Lampkin. It came as quite a surprise to find that a property developer like yourself could take an interest in our theatrical heritage. I'm interested in money, you idiot, thought Strode. Something you and your board seem to be singularly unable to make. We can cut the tour short now, said Mountford. I'm sure Mr. Strode has a very tight schedule. First sensible thing anyone said since I got here. Yeah, right, he said. I just needed to see the place in person. Never delegate the important stuff, that's my motto. Very wise, said Mountford. You're sure you don't want to see our extensive collection of Victorian posters, asked Lampkin, plaintively. Strode, struggling to keep his temper, said, No thank you, I have a flight back to London at, then he stopped, turned, stared at a corner of the stage. There was nothing there. But Strode was sure he had seen a flurry of movement. Perhaps it was a shadow cast by someone dodging into the wings. Strode had a deep aversion to anyone overhearing his business talks and insisted that they never be recorded. Something wrong? asked Mountford. All three were now looking to the left of the stage. No, no, said Strode, I just thought I saw something. Hey, what is that thing? He pointed to an odd-looking wooden chute that emerged from the wall. It was in the area where he thought he had seen movement, and Strode felt a sudden unaccountable urge to know more about it. Ah, said Mountford. The thunder run. Stuart is the man to tell you about that. Yes, indeed, enthused Lampkin. It's a fascinating example of a 19th-century stage effect. You see, Drama at the time often required blood and thunder, and not metaphorically. Stage blood was easily done, but thunder took more effort. The little man turned to gesture out from the stage at the semicircular auditorium. The thunder run is a chute that passes behind the wall, around the entire theater, spiraling downwards. When a storm was needed, as in King Lear for instance, a series of six-pound cannonballs were deposited at the top of the run and thundered along behind the audience, creating a splendid effect. And that's where the cannonballs came out, asked Strode, pointing. Didn't they damage the stage? They landed on sandbags, put in Mountford. And were then gathered up by a young apprentice stagehand, who climbed a ladder and put them back in at the top of the run again. Mountford indicated a place high above the right side of the stage. Strode could just make out the beginning of the shoot. Okay, he said, quite a nice anecdote for the guys at the golf club. Thanks. Oh, that's not the main story, said Mountford, with an odd smile. Stuart, you should tell him, it's your pet obsession. Strode looked at Lampkin, who seemed to be sweating even more, seemed to hesitate. Perhaps I'd better explain, said the woman. The theater is supposed to be haunted by the ghost of a boy who died working the thunder run. Ghosts. Now I've heard it all, thought Strode. These people are going to be a pushover. Tell me more, he said, faking enthusiasm. The boy, named Tommy, had to put the cannonballs in the run, 
slide down the ladder, then run behind the backdrop to collect them, explained Mountford. One night Tommy tripped, fell headlong into the sandbags. Just as the first ball came out of the run. Strode had a sudden vision of the accident, could even hear a boyish cry of despair as the apprentice fell. Then he heard the sickening crunch, saw blood and brains spill onto the sandbags and the gas-lit boards, heard the absurd, inevitable cry go up. Is there a doctor in the house? What? asked Lambkin. I didn't quite catch that. Did I say that aloud? Must be letting these idiots get to me, thought Strode. He was shocked at how undisciplined his imagination had become all of a sudden. Normally his mind could be relied upon to focus on business, or the various forms of pleasure his wealth bought him. Nothing, he said. Cool story, but I must be going. As I said, the formal offer for the site will be with you before the weekend, and, he stopped, seeing Lambkin's aghast expression, Mountford's cynical smile. Shit, he thought, I've done it now. Letting a bloody ghost story rattle me like that. Sight? asked Lambkin. Did you say sight? Mr. Strode is a developer, purred the woman. That means he knocks down old buildings, puts up new ones. Strode took a deep breath. He had hoped to simply check out the structure and avoid any unpleasantness. Quite, he said. I'm buying up properties on both sides of Eastgate Road so as to create a retail hub. And that means a big car park. This site, plus the ones to either side, seem ideal for that purpose. Lampkin turned red and started spluttering, struggling to form words. But Mountford was, as always, ready with an articulate response. Mr. Lampkin and the other trust members thought you were offering to revitalize the Adelphi, she said. Your approach was worded rather ambiguously. Her tone called Strode a liar, a con artist. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, snapped the businessman. Because I've got quite a reputation for regenerating rundown areas like this. And before you tell me about this building's heritage, let me tell you something. Heritage, of itself, doesn't make money. You can talk about Stan Laurel, sure, but when we came in, I didn't see a single product on sale in the foyer with his face on it. But this is such a vital link to the past, began Lampkin. Strode cut him off with a peremptory gesture and started to walk off stage. The people who built this place wanted to make money, not establish a glorified museum. Anyway, the new complex will include a multi-screen cinema, something people will actually pay good money to enjoy. Unlike this old relic, Strode stopped, again taken off guard. The vibration coming through the floorboards was subsonic at first, but then entered his hearing range as a rumbling that seemed to circle the old building. Mountford and Lampkin were also frozen to the spot. The fat little trustee looked stressed enough to have a stroke. Mountford, to Strode's surprise, had lost her cynical smile and seemed to have turned a shade paler. The vibration ended, and they all looked at the end of the thunder run. Nothing emerged from the wooden chute. After a moment's silence, Strode gave a laugh. Well, this place will fall down of its own accord if they keep running twenty-ton trucks past it. Those old Victorians never saw that coming, eh? Lampkin scurried after Strode, trying to make him change his mind and become a friend of the Adelphi. I'm quite happy to remain an acquaintance, thanks, retorted Strode. Mountford, bringing up the rear, said nothing until Strode climbed into his rental car. She leaned down and spoke through the driver's window. I know I won't dissuade you from knocking down the Adelphi, she said. Your sort are always sure of yourselves. Starting up the Lexus, Strode looked out at her and raised an eyebrow. I'm sensing a, but, Dr. Mountford, so get it over with. Very well, she said. People who are, let us say, not friends of the Adelphi are said to incur the wrath of the ghost. Tommy is said to preside over productions at the theater. He can be a bit mischievous if anyone tries to undermine a production, a diva refusing to go on, 
that kind of thing. The show must go on, seems to be his motto. Who knows how he might react to someone seeking to stop the show forever. Oh, right, sneered Strode. And what will the brainless boy do? Bleed on me. Before she could reply, he screeched off into the afternoon traffic, blaring his horn at a van driver who did not give way quickly enough. As he headed for the airport, Strode tried to shed his irritation by reflecting on how well he had done. He now knew that the trustees were going to be a pushover. Why, only two of the nine had even bothered to turn up. If only he had not made that slip over his demolition plans. Still, that nonsense about the ghost would be a good one to tell the lads in the golf club bar. His like-minded friends shared his jovial contempt for artsy-fartsy types. He was so busy trying to find his way through the labyrinthine streets of the unfamiliar city that he did not even see the object before it struck. He felt it, though. The impact struck the offside front wing of the Lexus with a noise like a small bomb going off. He felt the shock through the wheel, and the seat. Swerving to the curb and swearing profusely, he got out to check the damage. Bang goes my security deposit, he thought. The object, whatever it was, had produced a dent three inches deep and twice as wide. Strode looked around, saw a group of teenage boys standing on a corner about ten yards away. He glared at them as one pointed, said something, and aroused general laughter. Little bastards. Chucking rocks at luxury motors out of envy. Some time in the army is what they need. Teach them discipline. Strode was about to start remonstrating with the youths when he reflected that starting a fight in a strange neighborhood was never wise. Also, he had to take into account the time needed to sort out the car rental, now that it was damaged. He never lost a deposit if he could help it, but this one would be tricky. Muttering obscenities, Strode got back into the car and drove away. He glanced back once, to see that the group of lads had moved on. Then he realized that one had stayed behind, loitering on the corner. The teenager was dressed drayably, except for what looked like an odd red and white hat of some kind. What is he wearing? Not a baseball cap, certainly. Then the road curved away and Strode could no longer see the boy. Provincials, he snorted, focusing once more on the road ahead. Two years passed. Two years during which Strode never returned to the city of Newcastle, instead delegating the Eastgate Road project to a succession of underlings. It proved even more troublesome than he had anticipated. There was local opposition against the demolition of the Adelphi, of course, and this proved more stubborn than expected. But even when demolition work began, there were unaccountable delays, with a high turnover of personnel and a series of bad accidents on the site. Some of his directors even hinted that Strode should go and sort things out in person. Strode retorted that he had a lot of irons in the fire and simply hadn't time to supervise every one. An underling then unwisely pointed out that Strode frequently took his current girlfriend to New York for the weekend. Strode fired the man on the spot, gave him no reference. But it was not pressure from work that aged Strode during those two years. It was the nightmares. They always began in the same way, with the two trustees showing him around the Adelphi. As they approached the stage, Strode felt mounting apprehension, knowing that something bad was imminent, but never being sure what was coming. And it was here that the lovable, gentle silent movie clown Stan Laurel had his head smashed in, said Lamkin. Skull reduced to pulpy fragments, blood and grey matter splashing out across the stage, staining the dresses of the ladies in the front row. No, that can't be right, Strode always replied. That's just crazy. I'm afraid that is the case, said Mountford. Breaking open a living human skull is always a crowd pleaser, however vulgar one might find such spectacles. And remember, it's so very profitable. You can't argue with free enterprise. Can you? Then the trustees seized him by the arms and dragged him over the end of the thunder run, forced his head down onto the bear, 
splintered boards. As the rumbling vibrating grew, he heard a vast, unseen audience behind him start to cheer, whoop, whistle. The thunder grew to fill his dream world. And then he always woke up, sweating profusely. If he was not alone, his partner would ask what was wrong, and he would say, nothing, go back to sleep. He would lie awake until the gray light of dawn gave him reason to get up and go to work. And every day he worked with the knowledge that the nightmare would come again. Then came the call. His site manager reached out, interrupting an important Skype conference with his European partners. Furious at this breach of protocol, it took Strode several minutes to grasp what he was being told. Boss, we can't open the car park tomorrow, said Gary Marlowe. His voice quavered, knowing that he was flirting with career suicide. No way can it be ready in time. What the hell do you mean, roared Strode. I put you in charge to get it done on time. You're my troubleshooter. Now you tell me you've shot yourself in your own bollocks. He was pacing up and down in his office at his country house, knowing that his underlings called him, the Caged Panther, when he was in one of these rages. He liked the nickname, but his doctor had told him to ease up on the tantrums. Remembering this, he stopped pacing and looked out of the French windows onto the lawn. Someone moved, ducking behind an ornamental hedge. Frowning, he tried to see if it was an interloper or just one of his groundskeepers. He leaned forward, staring. Boss, Marlowe was pleading, I did my best. I paid them way over the going rate and turned a blind eye when they took shortcuts with the small stuff. I told them they'd get a huge bonus if the complex was ready in time. But no dice. I could never get a big enough crew together. They kept getting spooked. It's like the business with the crane, you can't hush things up. Crane, asked Strode. What are you talking about? There was an accident in the first few weeks, boss, explained Marlowe. Don't know the details. Just know a wrecking ball fell on this guy. Somehow the chain broke just before they were going to smash in the facade of the old theater. I don't recall that, said Strode, puzzled, his temper starting to subside. Again, he caught a hint of movement by the shrubbery. A boy? Or a girl, maybe. Somebody on the small side, anyway. There was an investigation and a report by the Health and Safety Inspectorate, insisted Marlowe. Maybe you were too busy to notice. Right, right, said Strode impatiently. Now he remembered the incident. There had been a fuss in the national press, questions asked by snooping journalists, libelous claims made on social media. He ignored it all, and it had blown over. His dozen or so projects had frequent accidents. It was impossible to remember them all. Or did you just want to forget that particular mishap? The voice sounded in his ear, but not one to which he had pressed his phone. It was a quiet, breathy voice. Not that of an adult, he thought. Strode scanned the room but he was alone. A tiny voice came from his cell. Boss? asked Marlowe. I was saying, if you come up here, I could show you, I haven't got time to come up there, bellowed Strode. City planning departments say they won't sign off on the shopping mall if we can't provide adequate parking, said Marlowe in an even voice. They want you to sort it out in person. Strode would normally have erupted in fury at that kind of bureaucratic stonewalling. But somehow, the anger would not come this time. Instead, he looked out at the garden again, hoping to glimpse the boy or girl. Hoping for proof that the small, drab-clad figure was definitely outside. Boss? Marlowe sounded puzzled, anxious, perhaps wondering if Strode had finally had the stroke the entire board of directors had long expected. Okay, Gary, said Strode evenly. I get the picture. I'll be there tomorrow, book me a car and a hotel. He ended the call and then tried to resume his Skype conference. Unfortunately, the time difference meant that the Italians had already gone home. 
Discussions had to be postponed. Lazy Mediterranean bastards, growled Strode as he left his office and went into the palatial living room. No wonder the Roman Empire collapsed. What is it, babe, said Chantal, his latest paramour. She was draped on the couch leafing through a fashion magazine. A Bengal cat dozed on the floor at her feet. Nothing, sugar baps, he replied, throwing himself down next to her. The cat woke up at the noise of him hitting the springs, looked up with huge golden eyes. There was no love lost between Strode and the pet. I have to go up to Newcastle, he said, nuzzling up to Chantal and stroking her hair. I know, I promised you Paris, and we will go. But not this weekend. You'll have to be content with London for another week. The young woman made a wry face, then kissed him. I think we can forgive Daddy this time, can't we, kitten? Chantal scratched the cat between its ears. The animal purred, closed its eyes, and suddenly stiffened. It got up and stalked across the room, staring at the door to Strode's office. What is it, Lulu? asked Chantal, sitting up and disengaging Strode's hand from her left breast. Bloody animals crazy, grumbled Strode. Lulu. Chantal tried to grab the cat, but it had already dashed under the Regency sideboard. It hissed and spat when the woman tried to coax it out. The expensive ones are all overbred, grumbled Strode. Like those yappy little handbag dogs. They're stupid, unreliable. Shut your big fat cake hole, snapped Chantal. You always upset her, she's very sensitive. Like me. Strode began to make placatory noises, but it was too late. His girlfriend left the room, heading for the front door, and he recognized the signs. The slam of the front door was followed by the sound of a Porsche Boxster starting up, the clash of ineptly handled gears. Major shopping outbreak, Strode thought. All my credit cards left severely battered. Sighing, he decided to return to his office. But as he reached to open the door, he heard a noise from the other side. It was an exclamation of despair, followed by a sickening thud. Then silence. It took him several seconds to summon up the courage to open the door, and when he did, he flung it wide open like a TV cop on a raid. Nobody there, of course. I'm hearing things, he said. That bloody woman planted an idea in my head. Stress did the rest. Talking to yourself. The voice was so close, the speaker had to be behind him. Spinning around, Strode saw nothing living but the Bengal cat, jade eyes staring from the shadows. Oh, piss off, he shouted. Even if you are a ghost, you don't scare me. Go and haunt somebody else, some pansy actor. Make them piss their pants. You don't scare me at all. He turned on his heel to walk back to his desk and saw a drably clad figure staring into the room. The boy was about ten with huge, dark eyes. Strode felt his heart pounding, heard a distant roar like a waterfall getting louder. He felt himself falling, the world receding as if he had plummeted into a deep well. There's nothing wrong with me, discussion over bellowed Strode as Gary Marlowe started to ask him how he was. But, boss, Marlowe persisted. Maybe I should drive you into town. Just in case. It was not a stroke, just a minor seizure brought on by too much work, said Strode, snapping his fingers. Reluctantly, Marlowe handed over the keys to a silver BMW. As Strode drove them into Newcastle, he fired off a string of questions. By the time they had arrived at Eastgate Road, Strode had arrived to the conclusion that he was one of the few true grown-ups alive in the world today. Most of them are just kids, he thought. No guts, scared of their own shadows, easily fooled by daft stories. No wonder I always win. So they all ran away because of this ghost, asked Strode, cutting into Marlowe's long, rambling account of the last and greatest delay. Yes. Boss, said Marlowe meekly. There were noises, 
things were seen. You see, M. Marlowe could not meet his boss's gaze, stared out at the facade of the new shopping mall. I saw something I can't explain. And the noises, just shut up before I give you your cards, grated Strode. Right, let's have a look at the haunted car park, shall we? The BMW swung onto the ramp down into the brutalist concrete structure, taking them out of the autumn sunshine into chilling shadow. Marlowe grew quiet, shrank down in his seat, started to play nervously with his tie. Stop fidgeting, snapped Strode. We've got an appointment with that old bag, the trustee woman. Do you want to look weak in front of some kind of intellectual? Those wankers despise people like us, the wealth creators. We need to show them how strong we are. Marlowe sat up a little straighter, locked his fingers together in his lap. But Strode saw perspiration running down his subordinate's forehead, despite the coolness of the vast underground space. Isadora Mountford was leaning against her tiny fiat on the lowest level. Strode pulled up alongside her. Out of habit, he angled the big car so that it almost covered two spaces. When Strode got out, Marlowe stayed put in the passenger seat. Doctor, good of you to come, said Strode, not offering to shake hands. Instead, he took a gun-fighting stance, legs apart, in front of the academic. I want you to settle a little dispute I've been having with my boy here. Strode jerked his head back at the BMW. I don't have time for games, Mr. Strode, said Mountford. Why did you summon me to this monstrosity? To help lay a ghost, replied Strode. He raised his arms and turned to face away from the woman, yelling out into the shadowy void. To tell little Tommy to get stuffed. Mountford snorted delicately. But her hands, like Marlowe's, were fidgeting, twisting a large onyx ring. Seriously, said Strode, I don't need some bastard who died when Queen Victoria was still a hottie ruining my business. So I'm here to cut a deal. You know the story, what will it take to get rid of the troublesome boy? You believe in ghosts, now? asked Mountford. I believe in money and power and death, Strode shot back. I have the first two, Tommy has the third. I want to make it clear to him that his day is past, his haunting is pointless, his precious show can't go on. That's all. Mountford shrugged. I'm impressed, in spite of myself, she admitted. You're not quite the ignorant barbarian I assumed. But you need a medium for this, not a professor of history. You must know something, insisted Strode. At least give me a tip on where to start. I'll pay you for your trouble, if that's what you're worried about. The academic pondered for a moment, then said, according to all the stories, Tommy starts each haunting at the top of the thunder run, then goes down the ladder to die at the bottom, stage left. So if I could get to the silly bugger before he bashes his own head in, I might talk some sense into him. Strode felt a pang of doubt but it was the best idea he had heard. Hoy, Gary, move your arse, he shouted. Which level would be at the same height as the roof of the Adelphi? Reluctantly, Marlowe got out of the BMW, took out his tablet, and brought up old floor plans on screen. I reckon it would be the top level, boss, he said. Most of this place is underground, so dash, yeah, yeah, interrupted Strode. Right, Let's get up there and I'll face the little sod down. Marlowe did not move. Get in the car, Gary, growled Strode. Or don't make any long-term financial plans. Your choice. Marlowe moved closer to Mountford, looked down at his shoes. Right, bugger off then, shouted Strode, climbing into the sedan. I'll deal with you later. It took him three minutes to spiral his way up the vast structure. As he hurled the car around corners and up ramps, he heard a rumbling sound above the protests of gears and brakes. Yeah, Tommy, you give it the works, he said grimly. We'll see who can make the most noise. 
The thundering sound died out as he stopped the BMW in the middle of the top level and got out. Strode looked around, saw no signs of life, and walked around to the trunk. Well, Tommy Trouble, he said, let's see how you cope with a bit of old school magic. A few months after the nightmares had begun, Strode had started googling hauntings, ghosts, and exorcisms. He soon realized that his public image would be damaged by trying to involve a spiritualist, let alone the clergy. But he gleaned that less powerful spirits could be curbed by other means. He lifted a large plastic sack, one of several, out of the trunk and set off for the exit ramp. Strode felt watched, was sure eyes were focused on his back, but did not bother to look round. When he reached the top of the ramp, he opened the neck of the sack and began to pour its contents across the roadway. Ordinary sea salt, Tommy, he said. Said to be the ideal barrier to all occult forces. Let's give it a try. And if this doesn't work, well, I've got a few other tricks. Amazing what you can get online these days, isn't it? Oh, sorry, I forgot. You got killed before they had electricity, never mind computers. After salting the exit ramp, Strode continued to lay a line of salt around the edge of the entire parking deck. He was half done when the rumbling began again, a steady vibration that circled him like a predator calculating its best line of attack. Do your worst, you little bastard, he shouted, picking up his pace. Got you rattled, eh? The source of the rumbling stopped moving, was now definitely coming from just ahead of Strode. The sound grew louder. Then the boy appeared, without any CGI preamble. One second the view was of fresh concrete and yellow-lined parking bays. Then Tommy was falling forward a couple of yards in front of the businessman, the boy's bloody brains spilling out onto the gray floor. Shit! Reeling back, Strode dropped the sack of salt, and it burst. Tommy vanished as suddenly as he had appeared, the splash of red and white matter gone as if it had never been. Cheap tricks, bellowed Strode. If that's the best you got, you got nothing. He set off back to the BMW, determined to finish the salt ring and then use some of the more advanced items he had obtained thanks to his wealth and tenacity. But as he turned on his heel the thundering noise returned, oddly changed. Something small and dully shining moved in the corner of his eye. Before he could focus on it, he felt a terrible impact in his ankle, heard bone crunch. Pain more intense than any he had felt before shot through his leg, and he pitched forward, landing heavily on his hands and knees. A speckled iron cannonball rolled briskly past, just a few inches below his eyes. The metal sphere continued across the deck and then rolled out of sight down the exit ramp. You were warned, silly, fat man. The voice in his ear was gleeful, that of a child enjoying being naughty. You evil little prick, cried Strode, weeping in pain. He struggled upright and started to hobble to the BMW. The sound of distant thunder returned, growing rapidly louder. No, he moaned, casting anxious glances around the level. Again came the flicker of movement, but this time he was ready for it, tried to jump over the cannonball. He had forgotten his damaged ankle, and while his clumsy hop saved him from another hit, he landed badly. The pain was searing, now. Leave me alone. Memories of childhood bullying mingled with humiliations of adolescence and youth, a rogue's gallery of persecutors running through his head. You won't beat me. I always win, he gasped, climbing into the BMW and slamming the door. He waited for another ball to appear, knowing one could damage the vehicle. Perhaps even immobilize it. Don't get trapped up here. Moving target. Strode started the engine and clashed the car into gear. The roar of German engineering made it impossible to hear the next ball, and it was moving swiftly and too low to see. But Strode felt it clearly enough as it smashed into the right rear wheel with a sickening metallic crunch. The car slewed, the damaged wheel screeching, and Strode struggled to avoid hitting the walls of the exit ramp. 
Not good enough, Tommy boy, he said, regaining control. Soon be out of here, then we can arrange a rematch. He glanced at the rearview mirror, glad he had had the sense to close the trunk. At the top of the ramp, he glimpsed a brown and gray clad figure, its head mostly reddish mush, raising a hand. Wave me goodbye, eh? The throbbing pain in Strode's ankle made braking difficult and the car kept picking up speed as he headed for the lower level and safety. He had to focus entirely on control, and so didn't hear the rumbling until the ball was almost upon him. He glimpsed a huge, curved shape in the wing mirror, a ball vastly larger than any old-time cannon could have fired. It's the size of a bloody fridge. That's cheating, that's against the rules. Strode swerved off the exit ramp onto an intermediate level, but not quite in time. The four-foot-wide iron ball sideswiped the BMW, knocked it skidding crazily sideways. Strode felt the car lifting onto two wheels, prayed for it to stay upright. It did, but landed with a jarring crunch that again shot bolts of pain through his injured leg. The engine cut. Strode began to pray aloud as he twisted at the ignition. Please God don't let it, please God don't let it, the car started just as a ball, at a good six feet across, appeared on the ramp from above. It thundered toward Strode as he screeched around in a handbrake turn, feeling the BMW's battered mechanism protest. Again, the ball sideswiped the car, spinning it wildly until it slammed into the concrete wall. Strode, who had not had time to buckle up, struck his head against the door jam and blacked out. Did you hear that? Isadora Mountford paused in the act of climbing into her fiat, cocked an ear. Sounds like thunder, she said. Would you like a lift? Or are you going to wait here for your boss? Marlowe stood, the picture of indecision. You really care about that ghastly man, don't you? asked the woman. Amazing. I should have gone with him, said Marlowe. Can you take me up? It was Mountford's turn to hesitate. The rumbling noise grew, then died away. All right, get in, she said. As they ascended the car park they made awkward introductions, and Marlowe asked if Tommy had ever seriously injured anyone. No, said Mountford. But remember he was previously bound to the Adelphi. Part of the building's fabric, really. Who knows what he might be able to do if freed from what one might call his original contract of employment. You mean he might be like asbestos, asked Marlowe. Better left alone. Or got rid of by real experts, yes, said the woman, smiling. Though your analogy is a tad prosaic for my, she stopped as the fiat reached the third level, halfway to the top. Christ Almighty, exclaimed Marlowe. The concrete roadway was badly cracked, as if a huge juggernaut or maybe a tank had passed this way. I know the specifications of that stuff, said Marlowe quietly, as Mountford drove them off the ramp. Nothing that could drive in through the entrance would be heavy enough to break it. And yet broken it is. Mountford stopped and got out, Marlowe following cautiously. Look, he said, pointing to skid marks on the cracked floor. Boss came in here, in a hurry. Then where is he, demanded the academic. They looked around in puzzlement, seeing no sign of the silver BMW. Then Marlowe pointed at the far corner of the parking space. Just a few bits of junk, opined Mountford, as they walked over. I can't see how this is relevant, again, she stopped talking and stood, staring in puzzlement at the patch of debris. Now she was a bit closer there was something familiar about it. The silver color, for one thing. Fragments of tinted glass lay in a spray pattern around a roughly rectangular object. There were also patches of a red so dark it was almost black under the strip lights. Oh Jesus, oh God, exclaimed Marlowe. What has he done? Good question, said Mountford, let's go. They hurried back to the Fiat. Mountford was just driving onto the bottom level when they heard the thunder again, 
and the square patch of daylight at the exit was blocked by a great, round shape. Next story. Faces by A. I. Nasser. Dr. Riley. The voice was old, raspy, almost inaudible if not for the fact that I was listening for it. I turned, as did the six or seven other gentlemen standing in a semicircle around me, listening to my newest surgical conquests. I smiled at the man striding across the large foyer towards me. He held a cigar in one hand, and the slender arm of a beautiful brunette in the other, both smiling, but only one of them genuinely. The older man didn't seem all too pleased to see me. Dr. Alcott, I greeted, giving a slight bow, briefly acknowledging the young woman with a gentle smile. It's been too long. Indeed, it has been, Alcott replied. He kept his gaze fixed on me, an alarmingly challenging look if I did not know better. I'm quite surprised that you were able to make it to my gathering, what with your busy schedule and all. I raised my glass in a silent toast and winked at him. I could not imagine missing it, Dr. Alcott, I said. A man of your stature deserves to be celebrated for all his achievements. What would it say about me if I were not to make an appearance at such a gracious event? Quite a lot, I would imagine, Alcott chuckled, although his eyes reflected a darker sentiment. I turned my attention to the young woman, took her hand and kissed it. And may I assume that this fine young woman is your daughter? Your flattery is almost suffocating, Dr. Riley, Alcott laughed, gazing hard at the others in a silent order that they laugh along with him. They did. Anna, the young woman introduced herself. Granddaughter. I feigned surprise. Dr. Alcott, you will forgive me, I said, but it was quite miraculous that even as a grandfather, you still make the rest of us seem so small. I applaud you, sir, and feel humbled in your presence. Enough of that, Riley, Alcott smiled, attempting to hide the annoyance in his voice. He chuckled, eyeing the rest of the group, faking an attitude of control I could easily see through. It wasn't a surprise that he would be uneasy with me being here. We were, after all, rivals, and although he had come to speak of me as simply that other doctor, I had heard the whispers. He detested my existence in this world, in his sphere of influence. I was a threat to everything that made him unique. I was the younger version of him, the man who would eventually surpass him and make his accomplishments seem trivial. I did little to hide the fact that I understood this, and even as I sipped from my glass, I kept my eyes locked on his. There was fury there. A fire. Hatred, even. I relished every moment of it. Well, you must excuse me, gentlemen, he said to the men standing around me, purposely ignoring me. I have other guests to greet and see to. I leave you in the capable hands of Dr. Riley. He looked at me. Try not to bore them with the dreams of young minds that have yet much to learn. I would never imagine it, I smiled, raising my glass again. A toast, to Dr. Alcott and his achievements. I gave Anna a quick wink, one I was sure Alcott noticed. Each and every one of them. Anna smiled at me, and was hastily pulled away. She glanced back at me over her shoulder, a quick gesture that could be mistaken for a flick of hair. I knew better, of course. I would be seeing Anna again very soon. The chill night air had found its way into my coat, and despite the warmth my clothes had promised to provide, I found myself shivering against the cool wind. The streets were devoid of any kind of life, save for the random rat here and there, scurrying from its hiding place to sniff at horse manure that decorated the cobbled streets of London. The light from the gas lamps flickered, casting long shadows against the dirty bricks of the buildings around me. Behind closed shutters, the soft voices of those who were still awake seemed to seep out, hushed whispers that found a way to coil around me and tickle my ears. I loved the night. I felt at home here, in the quiet darkness that was only ever disturbed by the sound of my walking and the occasional burst of laughter from a dark alleyway. The streets of London had a way of encompassing me, 
drawing me into their embrace with their filth and mysteries, a stark contrast to the bright and shining life of the elite dinner parties and gatherings I had grown to hate. The streets. This is where I thrived. This is where I felt the most at home. Like a character out of R. L. Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, I was enthralled by what the darkness promised. The sound of wheels on cobblestones and the faint ring of a bell made me turn around. Through the growing fog and the shadows, a carriage made its way towards me, lazy and awkward like a toddler that had just learned to stand on its own two feet. It stopped beside me, and a door opened, showering me in a bright light that made me cringe. The disturbance was annoying, except for the lovely face that was smiling down at me when my eyes finally adjusted and I could see Anna Alcott clearly. It would be shameful of me to leave you to walk home, Dr. Riley, the beautiful brunette said, her eyes glowing and her smile warm. Please, do come in. I tipped my hat and climbed into the carriage. As soon as I had settled into the seat opposite her, the door securely fastened behind me, the carriage lurched and continued on its way. A somber night to be walking the streets of London, wouldn't you agree, doctor? Anna asked. The night is a friend, I replied. As doctors, we work hard to understand the unknown, and what is more mysterious than the dark. Anna smiled, her hands folded on her lap. I can see why my grandfather hates you, she said. The cockiness, I presume. The confidence, she countered. I smiled. Your grandfather is not very fond of varying opinions, I said, and that is all I can say on the matter. Oh, I believe you have much more to say, Anna laughed, a soft giggle that would have been mistaken for childlike if I had not been gazing directly at the source. If you are in no great hurry, I would be most honored if you would join me at our home for a cup of tea and some friendly conversation. What would Dr. Alcott think? Anna's smile widened, a bit mischievously. Dr. Alcott does not need to know. I returned the smile, and we continued the rest of the journey in silence. The Alcott residence was quite magnificent, its splendor made even more impressive by the wide grounds around it. It was almost as if it occupied an alcove of magic in the midst of an otherwise gloomy city. Anna escorted me into the house, and gave me a quick tour of the main living area before leading me to the library. The room was stacked with books from wall to wall, and on one side, a large fireplace took residence, like a king on his throne. Around the fireplace were a pair of Untermeyer armchairs, and Anna gently gestured to one. This is quite impressive, I commented, squinting in the candlelight as I tried to make out the titles of some of the books nearest to me. My grandfather loves his antiques, Anna said as she rang a bell on the center table. The butler that came in was a gigantic, looming figure. His face was half hidden by the shadows, but I could still make out the misshapen structure of his jaw, and the grotesque way one eye seemed to hang lower than the other, as if sagging under some unseen weight. He stared at me for a second longer than what would have been considered polite, and I felt my body shudder under his gaze. T. Walter, if you please, Anna said. The man only grunted, looked at me once more, and slowly trudged out of the library. I watched him leave. He's quite harmless, Anna assured me, as if reading my mind. I would doubt that very much, I replied. So, tell me, doctor, what brings you to London? I relaxed, letting the fire warm my bones from the night chill that had found their way to them, and from the lingering image of Walter. Medicine, of course, I replied. Oh, I understand that, Anna said, her eyes fixated on mine. There was a confidence there that greatly mirrored that of her grandfather's. I merely ask why. What better place to continue your career than in London? I smiled. The opportunities are vast, the possibilities endless. A man can grow quickly and successfully here. Your grandfather can attest to that. I'm sure, Anna nodded, turning to stare into the flames. The logs cackled, firing small sparks that quickly disappeared. 
my grandfather has made himself quite a fortune since coming to this city. I frowned. You are not a London native. Anna turned back to me and smiled. Of course, she said. I am. My grandfather, on the other hand, is from Edinburgh. Although you would not have guessed it. My eyes widened. I would not, I agreed. There is not a hint of a Scottish accent in his voice. He's a chameleon of sorts, Anna nodded. Changes faces faster than anyone I know. He has always taught me that to survive in this world, one must have a dynamic personality, an eagerness to bend with the tides. Sound advice. And I would do well to heed it, Anna said, looking back to the flames. It seems, with the way the world is changing, it is advice that must not be ignored. Indeed, I agreed. The sound of cups clattering against saucers interrupted the silence we had fallen into, and I did my best not to turn and watch Walter enter the room. He worked silently for a man of his size, and I did my best to keep my eyes downcast. Nevertheless, I could feel him watching me, his gaze like a boulder on my chest. He handed me my cup, for which I thanked him, quickly and quietly, and he replied with a grunt. After he left, I raised my eyes and met Anna's. Does he disturb you? she asked. Not in the slightest, I lied, and I could see she didn't believe me. To be frank, I questioned the reasoning behind his disfigurement. Do you mean what happened to him? I would rather not intrude, I said, raising a hand to stop her. A man's business is his own. Something my grandfather taught me. However, it does seem peculiar that, being in Dr. Alcott's employment, your grandfather would not have tried to remedy the man's predicament. And why would you call it a predicament? What else should I call it? Anna smiled and took a sip of tea. You see, I believe that is the true problem with surgeons, she said. That you see everything as a medical issue that must be cut and resolved. You regard Walter as an anomaly, and immediately presume that he must be fixed. However, Dr. Riley, Walter does not need fixing. He is quite unique the way he is. I apologize, I said, taking a sip of my own tea and placing it on the table beside me. I did not mean to be presumptuous. That is quite all right, Anna assured. Walter has been in this family for years, generations even. My grandfather couldn't leave him behind in Edinburgh and brought him to London with him. I frowned again. He does not look old, I commented. How would you know? Anna smiled. You haven't properly looked at him. I nodded and took another sip of my tea. She was right, of course. I woke up with a start. The darkness engulfed me, surrounded me from all corners, deep and overbearing that I could see nothing at all. It was almost as if I hadn't opened my eyes at all. I could not remember when I had dozed off, and a sudden rush of embarrassment hit me at the thought of having had fallen asleep in Anna's company. But where was I? I was no longer in the library, of that I was sure. For starters, I was lying down on my back, no longer propped up comfortably in my armchair with a cup of tea in my hands. The air was colder here, thicker, a lot more suffocating. There was no residual warmth coming from the fireplace, and the sheer lack of light, the darkness that was so complete, made it frighteningly clear that I was so far away from any light source worth mentioning. My first instinct was that I had been brought up to a room, and I briefly shuddered at the thought of Walter carrying me like a baby, away from the library, away from the warmth. But even if this were a guest room of sorts, a candle would have been left for me. There was no reasonable explanation for someone to have left me in this darkness, a stranger in a strange place, with no bearings whatsoever. I tried to move, but my limbs were heavy, and I merely rolled onto my side before falling in a heap from whatever bed I had been laid upon. I felt drowsy, my mind spinning, my eyes watering, and the cold stone floor cut through my skin and to my bones like knives of pure ice. 
It was then I realized that whoever had brought me here, had also stripped me of my clothes, and that I was naked, completely. I pushed myself to my knees and turned my head left and right, waiting for my eyes to adjust, as they should, to the dark. When that didn't happen, I fought back the panic and began to crawl across the stone floor. I came across a wall, head first, feeling a sharp pain erupt at my forehead and quickly find its way down to my neck and spine. I let out an anguished hiss, and propped myself against the wall, ignoring the cold for the few seconds it took for the pain to subside. When it finally had, I tried to make sense of my situation. If there is a wall, then there must eventually be a door. The thought rippled through my mind, and I slowly pushed myself up to my feet. I patted the cold stones, moving slowly to one side in hopes of maybe finding a way out. The cold seeped up through my feet, numbing my toes and making each step feel like a toiled effort. I do not know how long I continued in this fashion, but I gasped in delight when my hands finally fell on a wooden frame, and soon enough, a handle. I turned it, quickly, pushing the door open as I stumbled and fell into a long hall. The lights blinded me, despite their dimness, and I shielded my eyes as I waited for my vision to adjust. The hallway was empty, devoid of any sort of furnishing that would give some clue as to where I was. This, in itself, frightened me. The torch above my head crackled as I took in my surroundings. It looked like I was in a catacombs of sort, below the house maybe, the hallway curving around a corner and blinding me from anything beyond. My head spun, and I felt my stomach turn. I pushed myself onto my hands and knees, and tried to steady my breathing. The dampness was overpowering, and the cold air made my lungs scream in protest. My heartbeat quickened until I could feel my chest threatening to burst. The tea. Of course, it was the tea. This was a trap. Had always been one. Anna had not been enthralled by me. She had not wished to bring me here for what I had assumed would be a long night of gentle lovemaking. No. She had drugged me. Or Walter had. This was all a ruse. Alcott's hatred for me multiplied to a point where he would rather have me hidden away than admit to his defeat. I needed to escape. If only my head would stop spinning and I could think clearer. The sound of footsteps echoed in the hallway, and a sudden burst of adrenaline brought me to my feet. I tried to discern the direction from which the sound was coming from, and when I could not, decided to choose a direction at random and follow it. My feet slapped silently against the cold stone floor as I moved. I closed my mouth, trying to force my breaths through my nose, fearing that any sound I made would give me away. The footsteps grew quieter until they finally stopped. I paused in my escape. Frowning. Concentrating. Listening for any sound that could give me a clue as to what I was to expect. The footsteps returned suddenly, this time quicker, running. Whoever was back there, they had found out that I was no longer in the room. They were coming for me. I threw caution to the wind and ran. The hallway twisted and turned, and in the dim light of the hanging torches, I gasped for breath as I pushed myself forward. The running grew louder, my pursuer closing in on me, and my heart jumped in my chest when I heard a distant grunt echo down the narrow passage to my ear. I was suddenly very aware of who or what was chasing me, and the thought of seeing that grotesque face come for me in the dark pushed me to run even faster. I ran like a man possessed, my muscles screaming with the strain I was putting them under. Strain they were not accustomed to. And the echoing sound of Walter's pursuit only grew louder. I turned around, saw nothing in the shadows cast by the torches, and pushed harder. I needed to escape. I could not imagine what that monster would do to me once I was in its clutches once more. I turned a corner and screamed in triumph at the sight of a cell door, and beyond that, stairs. I almost jumped the remaining distance to it, all too aware that Walter was closing in on me quickly. I pushed the door open, throwing my weight against it, and felt it slam back into me and send me flying back. 
I hit the ground hard, my head spinning even more, and quickly pushed to my feet. The door had ricocheted off the bottom stair, for it had been meant to be pulled, not pushed, and I had been too foolish to notice in my haste. I jumped onto my feet and raced forward, determined to make my escape, when a large hand wrapped around my neck and pulled me back, screaming. You must bend with the tides. The voice came from far away. I opened my eyes, slowly, immediately welcomed by a pulsating pain in the back of my head. I was lying on my back again, and as my vision began to clear, the haze on my eyes slowly disappearing, I turned my head towards the voice. Anna sat in a chair beside me, her hands folded neatly on her lap, her hair flowing in waves down her shoulders. I tried to get up, but I could not move, the sounds of chains rattling and the cold feel of steel cutting into my skin. I turned away from the woman sitting beside me, and noticed the shackles around my hands and feet. I fought against the restraints, but I was held down fast, unable to move. I was trapped. Obviously, Anna would not make the same mistake twice. You were not supposed to wake up so quickly, she said, making me turn back to face her. What are you doing? I shouted. Undo these shackles immediately. Anna laughed, no longer the childlike giggle from before, but a much more sinister cackle. It echoed off the walls and pierced my ears, sending shivers down my spine. My dear doctor, Anna cooed. You are in no position to make demands. Actually, you are in no position to do anything at all. Did your grandfather plan all this? I demanded. Did he ask you to bring me here? To drug me and then subdue me in this manner? Anna tilted her head to one side, the smile never leaving her face, and looked at me in pity. You are such a spectacular specimen, Dr. Riley, she finally said. A specimen? I frowned at her. What in heaven's name are you talking about? She chuckled and looked past me. I turned and followed her gaze, feeling myself shrink as Walter materialized from the shadows, his looming figure towering over me like the angel of death had come to collect me. In the light, his deformities stood out even more. His nose was crooked, as if he had broken it multiple times and had never had it heal properly. His eyes were as dark as obsidians, one much lower than the other, far lower than I had previously observed. His jaw also seemed to sag, and hung at an obscure, almost impossible angle. The skin on his cheeks looked like ripples of water, as if he were wearing a mask that didn't quite fit. He looked at me and smiled, and I felt a part of my soul shatter into pieces and disappear into an abyss of nothingness as I stared in horror at his visage. Unique, is he not? Anna asked. Her voice was no longer enchanting. No longer reassuring, gentle, welcoming, calm. It was laced with a manic sort of glee at my discomfort, and an undertone of bitterness. Let me go, I pleaded. Let me go, and I will never speak of this to anyone. I have complete faith that you will not. I will leave, I quickly added. I will disappear. I will take all my belongings, I will not even do that. I will just go. Leave London. Never again be a threat to your grandfather. Oh, do be quiet, Anna said, waving a hand, exasperated and frustrated now that I had stooped so low as to beg. James Alcott is not my grandfather. That would be quite distasteful if it were true. It does not matter. I stammered. I do not care who or what he is to you. I will leave him be. I will take my medicine and find some corner of the world where he will never have to hear from me again. India. Yes, India. I will leave for India immediately. That would be a shame, Anna replied. He is quite fond of you. I remember him saying that you remind him of a younger version of himself. She paused, her eyes boring into mine. A version he would most like to live again. I opened my mouth in an attempt to try a different approach to win my freedom, 
but all that came out was a pathetic whimper and a gasp for air. I was shaking, the cold and fear taking over, making the shackles around my wrists and ankles clang. Anna smiled at me, a cold curl of the lips I knew spelt nothing good for me. Anna stood up, slowly crossed the short distance to where I lay, and looked down at me. Men of science have always been narrow-minded, he said. You believe yourselves to be gods on this earth, when in reality, you are oblivious to the mysteries of it all. Of what hides in the shadows. Of the beings that live right beside you, that you are too blind to notice. You comprehend little of this world, Dr. Riley. Such an unfortunate waste of the mind. The door behind her opened before I could reply, and she turned to look at her guest. James, she greeted. We have been waiting for you. I tried to shift positions, an attempt to strain my neck and look beyond the curvaceous figure of the woman as she blocked the view of the door. There was a slight chuckle, a shuffling of feet, and soft footsteps that seemed to come from everywhere. James Alcott stepped into view, and I immediately fell back, hoping that the table I was tied to would somehow open and hide me within its structure. The eyes. It was the eyes that scared me the most. There was a menacing hunger there, a deep hatred mixed with a slight satisfaction that only a predator would save for its prey. They blazed with a desire to hurt me, to tear me apart from limb to limb, to make me suffer unspeakable pain. All of this I saw in his eyes, and in the slow curl of the man's lips as a smile materialized below them. My dear, Dr. Riley, James Alcott snarled. I do hope you are utterly uncomfortable. Dr. Alcott, please, I begged. I beseech you, let me go. I have told your granddaughter that I would sooner disappear than seek any form of retribution here. I will leave this wretched city and its inhabitants, and you will never see me again. Ludicrous, Dr. Alcott chuckled. Heavens no, I could not imagine this city without a Dr. Riley. You have so much to give, so much to achieve. I would not deprive London of the miracles Dr. Riley will one day perform. His words were like daggers, the mocking tone making my skin crawl. A harsh grunt brought my head around to Walter as he pushed a tray of surgical tools by my side, and then looked up to James Alcott with a grotesque smile that looked completely unnatural. Ah, Walter, Alcott nodded. Always in a hurry. What are you doing? Alcott shifted his gaze towards me, leaned against the table, and pursed his lips, as if readying himself for a long lecture. He seemed fatigued, beyond the stress of just having had attended a party in his honor. It was more a wearing of time, as if the universe had hacked away at him for far too long, and age was slowly becoming the nightmarish obstacle that could no longer be crossed. Time is not our friend, wouldn't you agree, Dr. Riley? I tried to reply, but the massive hand that suddenly rested on my chest, crushing the breath from my lungs, made that impossible. You see, to truly achieve greatness, one needs time, Alcott explained, nodding to Anna who disappeared from view. Unfortunately, time is not a commodity one can easily replace. This second is not like the last, nor in any way similar to the one that will come. But to live forever. Alcott raised a finger and shook it slowly at me. Now that is truly a miracle. I shook my head, unable to comprehend what the man was trying to tell me. I tried to shift my position, but Walter's hand on my chest kept me paralyzed in place. I looked at the butler, and he smiled back at me. For a brief second, I felt like the skin around his mouth had broken. No. Slipped. That was the word. The skin sagged and revealed his gums, as if it had been held in place by some form of stitching, and was now loose once more. I watched in horror as more of the skin around his chin folded upon itself, and the glistening of underlying muscle slowly showed itself. Walter noticed what I was staring at, and quickly receded, hiding in the shadows and fiddling with his face. I turned to Alcott, my eyes wide, 
and gasped something incoherent now that the weight on my chest was gone. Alcott was watching Walter with pity, then turned back to me. However, no miracle is true, and immortality comes at a price, he said, shaking his head. Is that not the case, my dear Anna? Anna stepped back into view and smiled at James. He folded her into his arms, gave her a long and passionate kiss, and then took the scalpel she had ready for him. She is your granddaughter, I stammered, although the real horror was in the way he looked down at me with the scalpel in his hand. She is my wife, Alcott corrected. For centuries, she has been nothing less, and always more. He looked at her and smiled. It took me quite a few killings before we finally found a face she liked. Killings. I choked. Alcott chuckled and gently grabbed my chin, turning my head from side to side, inspecting me. Yes, well, East London is filled with prostitutes no one will ever truly miss. And you, Dr. Riley, have a face that has already garnered a respectable following. Before I could reply, Walter's hand fell back down upon my chest, and Alcott leaned in over me. A fine face, indeed, he whispered. My screams filled the room as the cold steel began slicing across my jaw. London Daily Post, October 10, 1889 Renowned surgeon dies at 65. The London medical community was shocked at the news of Dr. James Anthony Alcott's death last night. Dr. Alcott was discovered in his London residence by granddaughter Anna William Alcott, his only surviving relative and heir to the Alcott fortune. The great doctor was known for his groundbreaking achievements in the surgical field, and will be forever remembered as an innovator and practitioner of remarkable talent. Dr. John Riley said it best during the memorial service, that Dr. Alcott was, a great man who will forever be remembered, and greatly missed, by all who respected his work. London Daily Post, September 7, 1890 Alcott heiress wed surgical wunderkind Anna William Alcott and Dr. John Fitzgerald Riley were married on September 4, 1890. The wedding announcement comes almost a year after the death of Dr. James Alcott, surprising many who had watched the rivalry between Anna Alcott's grandfather and her new husband. Speculations have risen regarding Dr. Riley's desire for a share of the Alcott fortune, which Anna Alcott has inherited as the sole living relative of the late Dr. James Alcott. However, close friends of the heiress assure that these are just rumors.